of its message for us this morning. Actually, on Friday, Joan and I were privileged to attend a dinner sponsored and put on by the Australian Christian Lobby with Martin Isles as the uh, new CEO. I say new, it's probably nearly 12 months he's been in the job, and I am greatly impressed by this young man, probably in his mid-30s, I don't know, it's hard to guess uh, somebody's age. I, uh, I've been reading his blogs a little bit on online, and uh, then he spoke powerfully of the need of our nation in terms of moral and ethical issues on a Friday night at that dinner. He said that we need to, as Christians, seek to change the political weather, that's the term he used, the, uh, the weather of our nation. And it is rather gloomy at the moment, if you look at it from a Christian perspective. And he asked the question, will one day the Bible be forbidden to Australians as it is forbidden in many other parts of the world? We have a fight on our hands and we have to engage in it. We can no longer simply come to church and be Christian. We have to engage our society as never before. I grew up in a Christian nation in the 50s. We could still say that we were a Christian nation then. People went to church, and if they didn't go to church, and they, confront, they were confronted by the gospel, they thought, oh, I better get back to church. And if uh, they were in the presence of a Christian, a non-Christian, they would not swear. And women didn't swear, and certainly men didn't swear in the presence of ladies back then either. But what a change. We are no longer a Christian nation. By the 60s, the tide was turning. And I guess like uh, frogs in slowly heating water, we were largely unaware of the change in our nation. Well, in the Western world, full stop. But uh, by the 90s, things had changed to the extent that now we can no longer uh, comfort ourselves in the fact that we are Christians. We've got to do something about it. We are opposed at every turn now. And we need to engage in the battle. We need to change, as Martin Isles said, the political weather, the moral weather, the climate in which we live. The climate, there is climate change, and it is to do with spirituality and, uh, social, and, and ethics and morality. So we need truth, as the ACL sub-logo says. We need the truth to be made public. And there is an organization in Sydney that advocates for public Christianity. At the same time, there are uh, people seeking to stop chaplaincies in school. There was that uh, Toowoomba, was he a businessman who took the Australian government to court twice to have chaplaincy stopped. And uh, now the uh, finger is being pointed at RI, religious instruction in schools, and there are those who want to stop that. And uh, so uh, Robbie Robbie, Robbie, Robbie Coleman from Destiny Church, who was our RI coordinator for this area, met with her husband and uh, government officials just a few weeks ago to put the record straight that people still want RI in schools. That uh, the figures that the opposition is quoting were misguided and uh, misquoted. But there are a large, there is a large portion of our society, parents who still uh, want religious instruction, Christian religious instruction in schools. Well, uh, that may change in 10 years time. The, you know, it may be that, that we will have an even bigger fight on our hands, but right at the moment we need to stand up for RI in schools. There, were, there, there, there are other issues. Yes, and Israel Falau was mentioned by name on Friday night, as you can imagine. That is also uh, part of the evidence for the nation in flux at the moment. Which way will the tide turn? Well, 
I uh, was digging in my files because this week was coming and going very quickly and uh, my time for sermon preparation was sliding away very quickly and I thought, well, will I ring up Jamie and ask if he's got a message up his sleeve? To... No, I didn't even think about it, uh, Jamie, but I was thinking of you on the road. What he, this week, I, I get dizzy thinking of Jamie driving that truck with 50 tonnes of something on, on the back. Is it two or is it three trips from Brisbane to Rockhampton? Three. Three trips to, to Rockhampton. And then not only back, but out to Billa Wheeler and back. And yeah. Think of Jamie on the road. I did some heavy, uh, I've got an HR license, but I thought, oh, I'd up, better upgrade it about 10 years ago. And I went down to Major, and uh, the instructor told me that he's not driving the heavy rigs anymore. Too many of his mates were being killed in truck accidents. So it's a big job. You kind of don't make me feel any better at my No, I mean, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, and already I. Uh, Cheering him up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm coming to the good. I'm coming to the good stuff. Stuff here in a minute, Jamie. Just hold, have your Bible open, and uh, and, and listen up. There's good news at the end of this uh, this struggle that we're involved in at the moment. Anyway, so I started digging in my filing cabinet for old sermons, <laughs> and uh, I pulled it. I pulled out one, and it was Psalm 29. And I got the notes here, and I thought, yeah, I can rework that. That would be pretty good. And this newspaper cutting, this is 1995, and uh, the uh, heading says, or the first line says, are scientists, traditionally the art agents of atheism, becoming the prime movers behind proving there is a God? Incredible though it seems, that's the way things are moving. We're confronted at every turn by atheism, uh, in t uh, terms of secularism, humanism, and uh, Darwinianism, evolutionary theory, and so forth. But the ever accelerating advances in computers now enable scientists to make calculations on such a scale that the origins of the universe, long the subject of debate between bishop and biologists, are becoming clearer. Uh, I read the next paragraph, at last it looks possible that researchers will prove there is a supreme intelligence and be able to describe it. Well, maybe that's going a little bit far, and this is 1995, that's a uh, long time ago now, uh, but, and, and in fact, uh, the article quotes Richard Dawkins, a fellow of New College in Oxford, who sees the universe as an autonomous happening. He argues that it emerges, it continues, and it'll eventually disappear without a master plan. He's in for a surprise, isn't he? Uh, yeah, we need to pray for the Richard Dawkins of this world. He fires off articles and letters to newspapers in all directions, and recently I blew off a letter to an organisation in South Australia called Plain Reason advocating for Australia to become a secular society, devoid, no, no public mention of religion at all. Well, fat chance they've got, because they've got a fight on their hands. But, and uh, I don't have Richard Dawkins' address, or I might have even written a few letters to him by now. But anyway, uh, we uh, turn to scripture and uh, realize, as St. Paul put it in one of his letters in the New Testament, that we poor humans have always seen through a glass darkly or dimly, and that the moment of true understanding will not occur until we see God face to face. Well, we haven't done that yet, so we're still living by faith. But I tell you what, there is a mountain of evidence gathering in our favour. That is the favour of those who believe in a supreme being. I did have a PowerPoint picture, Linda, that I had decided not to bring, but it was a picture of uh, uh, the whirlwind and bits of aeroplane parts flying around and uh, a, a professor looking on said, oh, give it enough time and this plane will assemble itself. Well, 
that's the trinity of evolutionary theory of godless existence. Father time, mother nature, and lady luck. That's evolutionary science. I mean, it's not science really, it's just assumptions that are ludicrous really. So we need to rethink our stand with God and engage in the battle. Also on Friday night was a senator called, a Queensland senator called Amanda Stoker, who is a lawyer in her own right. And she's married and she has several children, I think all girls, if I remember rightly. But anyway, she spoke powerfully about uh, uh, things that are happening, things that she is confronting in her role as a senator. And she says this, and I haven't got it verbatim, Christians since the marriage debate, is that nearly two years ago now? Christians since the marriage debate, in other words, do we allow the definition of marriage to change to allow non-married uh, homosexuals to uh, marry? As Christians since the marriage debate are beginning to rise up together. Yeah, there was a lot of division, a lot of uh, contradictory voices going out there, weren't there, about the marriage debate. Oh yes, we should let them marry. Yes, we should change the definition of marriage. No, we shouldn't. The Bible says this. And so the debate went on and on. But uh, increasingly, Christians are beginning to rise up together with one voice about the truth, the Bible being the truth that is. So let's turn to the Bible ourselves right here this morning and just have a few devotional thoughts from this psalm, Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty, o ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. Ascribe. I did look up the uh, original language text. Uh, Rob, uh, I showed Rob uh, Hebrew Bible the other night and we were going to study Hebrew and he meant the book of Hebrews so that's what we're studying in our Tuesday night uh, but the Hebrew word uh, uh, is literally give give to the Lord O sons of the might, o almighty and uh, the NASB is called it a scribe that's a more lofty term isn't it Ascribe to the Lord, or give to the Lord, glory and strength. In other words, confess that he is strong. Confess that he is glorious. That word, that same Hebrew word is used in Deuteronomy 32. And uh, if I found this text earlier, I might have had Joan play it uh, for us this morning. And we could sing it, because back in the... Uh, Oh, back in the 90s, I suppose, we were singing this as a scripture and song chorus. I'll start at the beginning, then you'll start to hear the familiar words. Give ear, O heavens, and let me speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. Let my teaching drop as rain, my speech distill as the dew, as the droplets on the fresh grass, and as the showers on the herd. For I proclaim the name of the Lord. Ascribe greatness to our God. There it is. Ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just. You familiar to you, that the chorus? Yes. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Ascribe greatness to our God. Give the worship of uh, that is due to his name because he is great and ascribe glory and strength to his name that word glory in English is of unknown origin I did look it up in my dictionary which tells me where these words come from uh, but it couldn't tell me where the word glory came from somewhere back in the dim distant past of English language uh, but the word in the Hebrew is kabbalah and it means weight. So you have a weighty argument, you have a weight, an argument that's strong, don't you? You have a, an argument that stands up to the test. 
And this is the Lord. He is weighty. He is glorious. He is able. So that's all involved in the word glory. So it's not just when you uh, win a gold medal at the Olympic Games that you receive your glory, but God is glorious anyway, all the time. And he's all the time winning battles and winning races, so to speak. Yes, uh, he is glorious. He is weighty. He is somebody to be contended with. And the word strength is there too. And uh, of course, we know that he is strong. And because he is strong, we wish he would exercise that strength in our lives, in our personal lives, more and more often. But we've just studied the book of Job for the last six weeks, and we saw that God never tells us why he lets suffering happen to his people. He just tells people that he is strong, that he created the universe. He is ordering the events of this world, and that's enough. He is a good God, and we don't need to know why He is doing what He is doing. We don't need to know why He's not doing what we would like Him to do in our lives. We can only rest content that because He is strong, because He is glorious, He is working all things out together for good for those who trust Him, who are called according to His glory. Yes, we are to worship the Lord in holy array. Worship, glory, those two words really sort of go together, really. Worship, where does that word worship come from? Does the word suggest anything? Worthship. Worthship. Give the Lord glory. Tell him what he is worth. That's what we do when we praise him and uh, in what we do when we worship him. Worship the Lord in holy array. Well, there's a little bit of conjecture as to what that might mean, holy array. I've got my jacket on this morning. I don't always come summertime, I won't be wearing a jacket to church. But back in the 90s, I keep parking back to the 90s this morning, I always wore a shirt and tie and a jacket to church. And uh, yet I would see the youth group coming to church with their t-shirts with questionable mottos on them and then the next day I'd see them in their black suits, white shirts and tie catching a train into the city to work. So anything goes when you come to church but you have to dress up for the CEO of the big company that you're representing. Uh, a little bit twisted I think but maybe a suit and tie is a little bit overdone for church anyway but what is holy array? You work it out. Maybe it's to do with your character before the Lord, your inner character, what you, what, you dress, what you dress your spirit with, what you feed your spirit on. Let's worship the Lord anyway. And remember, this Lord does speak. He doesn't answer all the questions we have, and He doesn't speak with a voice that uh, we can always relate to. Look at those next few verses. It's scary, really. When the Lord speaks, you, you tremble, you tremble. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters, and I've been on the waters <coughs> in stormy weather. I had a sailboat uh, years ago in the Arabian Gulf and up here on Lake Gavarabar, and I used to enjoy sailing in calm weather. <laughs> but as soon as the waves get up beyond about 20 knots, <laughs> I can't handle it. Uh, fortunately, I was always sailing within sight of the land, and hopefully I was able to swim and make it to the shore if my boat left me high and dry. No, that's a poor illustration, isn't it? Wet and, wet and uh, drowning. Uh, yeah. But the Lord speaks. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. Yes, when the waves get rough, you cry out to God. I tell you, the God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. And uh, I know uh, growing up on a farm, you know, every now and again you see the 
the consequence of a, a severe storm that would go through and you'd see trees all bent and twisted uh, that even a D9, the bulldozer that was in vogue in those days, it couldn't move. Yeah, God is powerful. He breaks the cedars and uh, so on. The Lord thunders. The Lord makes the... Uh, the uh, it's interesting, it says he makes the... Uh, uh, oh, I've lost it. Yeah, here it is, verse 9. He makes a deer to carve. But not just a deer, of course, but all the animals. He set a time for gestation and pregnancy. And uh, each animal, each human is different. And uh, yes, the Lord has orchestrated all this. He's powerful, all right. And when he speaks, we'd better listen. And of course, sometimes he has to bring the storms into our lives to get us to listen, doesn't he? But in these last days, he's spoken to us through his son. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. He has spoken to us by his son. That's a much more gentle voice. Yes, a voice of grace. Boy, do we need grace. I do, all the time. I am so apt to sin in thought or in deed, uh, anger when I need to be angry, upset about things I shouldn't be upset about, uh, perhaps I should be more upset about righteousness and things like that. That's the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ that we need to be listening to because he has spoken to us in these last days by his Son. Let's sing a song about that as we conclude this morning.